are obnoxious at times because they just kind of force you into something. It's like, uh, you know, if you're on a survey question, have you stopped beating your wife yet? Um, you end up with a very forced answer, none of which you're satisfied with. So if we need PowerPoints, we'll scurry through them. If not, I'm not going to worry about them. Um, I think one place to start off with is something we were trying to get across uh, yesterday, <clears throat> and that is uh, thinking conceptually and the importance of doing so in social science research. Three weeks ago, I was at, uh, in Amman, Jordan, at the uh, Columbia University Middle Eastern Research Center. And we had a five-day seminar on evaluation and assessment techniques. And the interesting thing about this was is there were 32 people there, all of which had, uh, well, some of which had had 30-some-odd years of doing evaluation and assessment. Some had been told by their employer, oh, you're the M&E person, monitoring the valuation person, two weeks before, and chucked into the, into the context. So you had this really wide range of people who had a lot of experience and some who had very little, if any, at all. And part of what we wanted to talk about was don't think of yourself as an M&E person. Think of yourself as a social scientist. If you think of yourself as a social scientist, you start thinking about all the different conceptual elements that are available within the social sciences, you've dramatically increased the base by which you can work from. My argument to my students is um, stop studying one eyed Lithuanian weightlifters. It's just kind of a phrase that came up with a long time ago, but it works, okay? Is one eyed Lithuanian weightlifters, fine, great, but it's a thing. But if I'm going to study one-eyed Lithuanian weightlifters, uh, how am I going to do that? So the student goes out, looks into the library, gets onto all the databases. Ralph, I didn't find anything on one-eyed Lithuanian weightlifters. Duh. Why would you expect to? Okay? But what could you find something on that would actually get you to study one-eyed Lithuanian weightlifters? What are some concepts embedded in that thing? So sports, activity, what else? Visual impairment. Visual impairment. So how about disability? Would there be a broad-based literature on disabilities? Yeah. Good. What else? Lithuanian. Baltic states. Baltic states. Still a thing, though. But getting broader. What else? <coughs> Excuse me. Ethnicity. Yeah, yeah very good. Ethnicity. <laughs> Ethnicity. And so all these are big concepts. And I have had projects where I have supposedly studied catfish in the Mississippi Delta, goats in Kenya, sheep in Indonesia, you name it. But I don't study things. Again, I study concepts. And the best applied research to me is research that has firm theoretical grounding. I think we have all kinds of weird false dichotomies in the social sciences. It makes for great armchair arguments, but it makes for really bad social science, whether applied or basic, and I just use one of those false dichotomies. Is the best applied research is predicated off the best basic research. Okay. Um, I think we have another one, qualitative versus quantitative. I think those are false dichotomies. They answer different things, they address different things, they're part of the same uh, scientific cycle. Is if I'm going to start afresh, and I have no idea what I'm looking at, but I know there's something out there that I need to do. I'm going to start with an inductive approach. I'm going to start looking at regularities of patterns coming across. I'm going to look at incidences of variables, and I'm going to start identifying them, and then I'm going to try to inductively think broader of what those might mean. In other words, what I'm going to be doing with qualitative research, inductive research, is I'm going to be theory building. I'm going to be looking for variables that I don't even know exist yet, trying to identify the ones that are of, of importance to whatever the project is. Okay, <clears throat> and I'll give you an example of that in just a second. And then 
I'm going to want to do a deductive phase, if at all possible. I'm going to want to test the relationships across known variables. <clears throat> and on those known variables, I'm going to hypothesize what the directionality is, what the intensity is, what the magnitude is, and I'm going to make testable hypotheses, ground them into empirically based data, and then run them. And so I need both. If I can do both, I'm always going to try to do both, inductive and deductive. One of the projects I had in Kenya was, I had never been to Kenya before. I went on this aid project, and I was told to find out why um, Kenyan farmers, goat farmers, were not using a vaccine that had been produced by USAID scientists. And there was this, uh, was, there were all kinds of weird assumptions going into this. Okay, there was this uh, back or this disease called contagious caprum pleural pneumonia, CCPP. Sounds like a Russian disease, but it wasn't. CCPP. And um, the job here was that CCPP would come through an epidemic fashion. It would wipe out herds of goats in a matter of days. And sometimes as much as 75, 80% of the goat herd would be dead within two or three days. Okay? And <clears throat> goats in Kenya are primarily up in the northern arid regions, okay? less so down toward Nairobi. And uh, a typical goat herd is maybe 50 goats or less. So I was told that we need to find out why, here's the words, here's the terminologies that were used, why those stupid peasants aren't using a vaccine that we know works. What's their problem? And then the other thing I was told, it has to be in the delivery system. And the reason it has to be in the delivery system is because the delivery system is socialist. I know, I, Look at all the different biases already coming into this project. So I'm told that peasants are dumb. I'm told that the delivery system is socialist, therefore it can't work. And then I'm told to go find out why those silly peasants aren't using the vaccine. And we don't. I figured it out in three days. It took me about three months to document it, but it took about three days to figure it out. And the long and the short of it was, it wasn't in, in delivery, it was in production. Okay. And one of the reasons I figured this out is I just started poking around and asking questions. And didn't let the preconceived biases necessarily too, too badly team me. So what I found out was that uh, this was prior to uh, multi-party politics in Kenya. So there was one party that ran everything. It was called the Common Government. Okay? And Daniel Arab Moy was the president. And Daniel Arab Moy, the president of Kenya, was from a Kalinjin tribe. And tri tribal politics, tribal identification runs Kenya. The Kalinjins were one of the smallest tribes in Kenya. There's this wonderful thing called nepotism, okay? That anyone and everyone that was in the Kanu government was a Kalinjin. They were producing a lot of beef, and in the and all of this beef was, a lot of this beef was being shipped over to the EU. But the EU had a policy that if Kenyan beef comes over into Europe, it had to be um, vaccinated for a foot and mouth disease, rinder pest, and a bunch of other diseases. Okay? So the Kenyan government had an economic incentive to make sure that cattle had been vaccinated. Well, if they're going to do cattle, they might as well do small ruminants too, goats and sheep. Now, if any of you have ever looked at any of this kind of stuff, you start to realize that goats and sheep are different from cows, and other than just the obvious ways. Socially and economically, goats and sheep are walking four-legged bank accounts. They're savings accounts. So peasant groups generally use goats and sheep as a way to have potential money invested in something that can be used in a variety of ways. They can kill it and eat it, they can milk it, or they can sell it if they need to buy school uniforms or books for their kids and such. So when an epidemic disease comes through and wipes out your bank account, it's very similar to losing your savings if, uh, or your stock accounts in the United States if the markets go down. So there's, there's a lot of anxiety about the security of their goats and sheep. <clears throat> so the Kenyan government decided that everything was going to be vaccinated because it was in the Kenyan government's interest to do so economically. So they created what they called a parastatal. And a parastatal is a government-ran organization that is supposed to work off market incentives. 
you know, I mean, we can get into a discussion about how well those kinds of things work when there's no opportunity for organizational mortality, but that's a whole different conversation. Okay, and so all vaccines, including the one that was produced by USAID scientists for goats and sheep for CCPP, were put into this new parastatal called Kavavavi, um, Kenyan Vaccine Production Institute. Well, here's the problem. Who's going to run a new government organization that's a Kalinjin? Because everybody's going to be a Kalinjin in the Kanu government. How many, how many Kalinjins had had any kind of background making vaccines? So the closest thing they could find was the former brewer of Tusker beer. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not that big of a leap, is it? <laughs> So they get the former brewer of Tusker Beer, he, who happens to be a Kalinjin, and they said, oh, by the way, you're now a brewer of vaccines. And so he gets all this stuff together, and he starts making vaccines, but there's a problem. Um, centrifuges that separate the antigens um, start to break down. Well, centrifuges are expensive. So <clears throat> he calls onto his, his professional history and background. And instead of using a centrifuge, he starts to use a Lister machine. Now, you're, you're, you, you know, if you have any kind of dairy background, a Lister machine is a cream separator. What used to take 60 hours to produce a batch of vaccine now takes 60 days. Okay? And the chrome on the blades of the Lister machine would flake off and contaminate or adulterate the vaccines. So over a short period of time, Kenyan farmers started to realize that if they used the USAID vaccine, their goats got sick anyway. They oftentimes got sick by injecting them into, uh, it with this vaccine because the vaccine was contaminated. And they also began to realize that even if they wanted the vaccine, they could never get it when they needed it. Next thing, is that the vaccine that had originally been produced by USAID was thermal stable, was, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, freeze dried. So you would reconstitute it with water, it could stay on the shelf at room temperature, even in a hot area of the world, with no problem, and it would have its um, efficiency and its, and its um, ability to combat the uh, disease for about a year and a half on the shelf. <coughs> now, dose of CCPP vaccine was one milliliter, okay? Typical goat herd was 50 or less. The new vaccine that was being produced by Kavavafi was coming in liquid form, 500 milliliter vials, and it had to be refrigerated. And it was in an area of Kenya where there were no refrigerators. And so the average farmer knew that, A, I can't get it when I want it. I can't get it on demand, 60 hours versus 60 days. If I drive into Nairobi to try to get some vaccine, there's a better than good chance there won't be any available. I have no idea when the next batch will be produced. And I also know from my, my colleagues down the road, so to speak, that if I inject this into my goat, they might get sick because of the vaccine. So what they started to do was use um, prophylactics, um, streptomycin and other kind of, uh, of penicillin-based um, antibiotics. And the goats would oftentimes survive, but they would survive with legions in the meat and other kinds of things, but they wouldn't lose their herd. So the scientists were looking back on those stupid peasants. Why don't they use this? And it's always got to be in the socialized um, delivery system, the, the veterinary system. So what we did is I got all this information, figured out what was going on. I, ha I asked them all to come to a meeting, and we all sat around a table similar to this. And I asked the, the USAID scientists, I said, tell us about the vaccine you developed, about, particularly about the, uh, the lipolized element of it, the freeze-dried element of it. And they were starting to talk, and these guys were going, what? And they, re they discovered that they had lost the recipe and that the production system wasn't working. And so, in essence, what happened is that we found out two things. Starting with an inductive process, not a deductive one, we had to do some theory building. And the theory building part was 
asking a variety of questions of a variety of people, trying to get a sense of what were some common patterns emerging, and then looking at how important were those patterns. Were they random? Were they there but just not important? And then, once we had an idea of what we thought was happening, we got everybody around the table to check the relationship across those variables. And sure enough, that's what, in fact, had happened, is that they had the wrong recipe, the, uh, the typical Kenyan farmer has 50 goats, he's not going to go into Nairobi and buy uh, a bottle of vaccine that has 500 doses and not be able to store it because he has no refrigerator. And so it all started stacking up rather neatly. Okay. Then the next thing we want to do is see how intense and how broad this problem is. That's when you do a survey. And surveys are appropriate at times. But surveys are very westernized. Okay, how many of you ever tried to do a survey outside of the United States? Let's start with a different question. How many of you ever lied on a survey? How many of you are lying now? Yeah, okay. um, or embellish something, you know. I mean, we all do that. Or feel like the, the information we got off the survey was crap. That is like, you know, I got forced into too many small boxes. Surveys are very useful. They're appropriate for certain things. But they're only appropriate, in my opinion, for a deductive component of research is after I've done my theory building, I want to see the magnitude and intensity of what I think are issues across known variables. But when I try to do surveys overseas, they don't work very well. So, I mean, you guys help me out. I've talked too much already. So, what are some of the primary elements of survey research that you're taught from the first moments of social science on that have to be in a survey in order to make it valid? Demographic, ethnicity, age, uh, gender. Okay, so very typical social demographic variables, right? So, I, you know, you never admit your biggest mistake. You always admit your second biggest mistake. My second biggest mistake once is I did a, uh, a survey in Alabama where I was looking at where the Mercedes Benz plant came in. I was interested in rapid social change in communities. This is a town of 150 people that Mercedes-Benz announced they were coming in there for their first American plant and it immediately mushroomed to 2,000 people. I forgot to ask age. I went all the way through this dang survey and realized once we got them all back in that somehow through all the edits, age got missed. Now what do I do with that? <laughs> I had to start trying to manipulate all these different things that might give me a, a rough indicator of age because to a sociologist, age is an indispensable uh, variable. Nicole? So I'm going to use a student story rather than my own biggest mistake. Um, you I have a friend. Yeah, I have a friend. Um, <laughs> and it was actually my first advisee, so it was probably my biggest mistake as the first advisee. She got a grant to do a research a project with the Talents Association. Uh, so um, what she was looking at is what's more effective uh, evidence. Is it narrative or is it statistics? So we had generated um, a number of, of beef appeals that was giving people permission to eat beef. Beef? So beef, yes. And so what we had to do is, well, first of all, we had to ask whether or not they were vegetarians, because mm -hmm. those people needed to be eliminated mm -hmm. because they would never eat beef anyway. And we also needed to eliminate people who were cattlemen um, themselves or producers, because of course they are, you know, go beef. So we needed to make sure that we uh, controlled for those kinds of groups. So yay for advisor. So I was like, whoo, got that one in there. Um, however, uh, so the way that it worked, we were doing this um, over survey research. So we had a program, a statistical program, that had two claims in the message. And then it had two pieces of evidence. Mm -hmm. And then when people would access the site, sometimes they would get 100% narrative. Sometimes they would get 50% narrative, 50% statistics. 25, 75, 75, 25, 100% mm -hmm. stats. So we looked at a number of different things like credibility and, um, and emotion and that kind of stuff. But we, the dependent variable was, were you persuaded? Guess what wasn't on the survey? The dependent variable. Oops. It was in the draft, but when it was typed in to, um, when it was sent to the survey folks who were actually generating the special system that could, could randomly put in the evidence, um, it didn't make the final cut, and quality control, that would be the advisor, um, thought, well, it was in the draft, it should be fine, I saw it in there. We gathered 600 
surveys with cattle and money. And no dependent, no dependent variable. variable. So we couldn't even go, well, we think that's the same thing. And that was, that was a big phone call. And that was just your second worst mistake, right? Um, <coughs> second worst mistake with a student. <laughs> yeah. We've got some coming in from online about uh, it's important for obviously geography where they are uh -huh. physically, uh, their, what types and uh, the sources of their education. But really, the thought is uh, form follows function. It's all about what your hypothesis is trying to test Good. with your concepts. Right. And so we'll just skip to the chase here a bit, and then I think we'll address this. So one of the things we're always told about surveys is you've got to read the question exactly the same to each respondent so that you're controlling for any kind of uh, presenter bias, right? And that the categories have to be the same. They have to have uh, a logical element to them so that there's not overlap and other kinds of things. One of the things I started experimenting with when I was doing research in, um, in Jordan as well as in Southeast Asia is doing surveys, randomized surveys, okay, but doing randomized surveys where they were presented in a narrative fashion. And so I would train the, uh, the surveyors, the, the, the people helping me out, to have these conversations. And then they would write down the responses. So if I needed to know, for example, how many people were in the household, instead of saying how many people were in your household, the survey instrument would said, find out how many people are in their household. So they, wouldn't, they couldn't just read it off. And we would train them not to read it off. But it was a cue, it was almost like an interview guide to the person doing the surveying. And then they would check it off and they would write in the appropriate number. And we told them that let the conversation, let the narrative take, take you where it's going to take you. Don't worry about going from top to bottom of each page and then going on to the next page. In fact, be very deliberate in not being deliberate, OK? Be very deliberate in just having that instrument sitting over here and then pick it up every now and then, scratch a few things in like you're taking notes, but what you're doing is filling in the boxes. Mixed results. And the reason it was mixed results, I think, is when people actually did what we asked them to do, the results were fine. But what tended to happen is then if somebody felt like the conversation got into a bit of a lull, they still picked up the survey instrument and used it as a crutch to keep the conversation going. Then they just started reading off questions. When they didn't read off the questions, I think it was fine. Did it violate some of the assumptions of survey research? Yeah, absolutely. But it was better that, that we, I think we got those data. And the data, I think, um, when we ran the statistical analyses on them, the data were fine. They, they were OK. They were valid. Um, but we got far better and more data by doing that than trying to do a very westernized approach to a survey. I think you need to do both, OK? Um, that's kind of what I wanted to start with. Is again, conceptually thinking, link yourself up to a variety of different issues. Don't we don't look at things, we look at concepts, but we study those concepts through things. And we're assigned to actually come up with an outcome for a specific event or a specific place or a specific thing. That's okay. We're still not looking at the event, the thing, or whatever. We're using a whole battery of social science concepts to help us up with an answer for this particular variable at this particular point in time. And then we're going to use the whole array of methodology that we have available to us. Don't get stuck into, um, well, I'm a qualitative theorist. I find those arguments rather ridiculous. We're not qualitative theorists or quantitative theorists or methodologists. We're social scientists. And if you've got multiple tools in your toolbox, you should be using them where they're appropriate. I often joke that I'm a sociological crescent wrench, is I'm going to adjust myself to whatever the the situation demands. And even if you have to hammer something, you can still do it with a crescent wrench. But I would prefer to be the 24 box craftsman toolkit. <laughs> yep. So that's what I want. All right, now I already talked and bored you too much. So you guys asked some questions. And what I prefer is that we have a conversation amongst yourselves. I'm not, I'll tell you where I think I can address it, I'll tell you where I don't think I can if I. If I'm just going to BS you, that's not going to be any good either. So, fire away. Great. Using an interpreter, I'm trying to apply qualitative text analysis or okay. narrative analysis. Right. How do you overcome that? With, oh boy. You mean using an interpreter where you're not 
we're not, we're not clear what can so you would have at least two down. filters going through. Okay. Um, it's a really tough question. Um, I think there are ways to ground truth this. Like if I'm going to trans translate a, uh, an interview guide or a survey instrument, I'm going to have it translated into the language, and then I'm going to have somebody who's completely unfamiliar with what I've done who speaks that language and also English translate it back. Okay, and then I'm going to compare the two versions, and I'm going to look and see if, if they're coming up with the same things. If they're coming up with really disparaging things, then I've got a problem. Okay, so my best my best assumption on this, because narrative analysis almost assumes that you're you're part of the nuance of a language and its backdrop. So you help me where you can, anybody, yeah. please, especially yes. those who speak English, perhaps, as a second language. Here's what I tried, but it was just time consuming. Okay. And actually, videotaping it and go between different, because it is different ethnicity. And right. everybody can tell you, this guy meant this. You go to the other person, he interpreted different according to his bias. Right. Within so the same within the same ethnic group or across no, that different group? That's interesting data right there. <coughs> Isn't it? Yeah. So maybe maybe one of the other you could ask a different question too. I'm not trying to dismiss the first question, but I think you've stumbled onto another very interesting question there. If somebody from a different ethnicity is listening or watching the same thing and coming up with a totally different response, one thing might be to expand the research question and see how common that same response is across those different ethnic groups. Then you've stumbled into something really interesting that within different ethnic groups is possibly a fairly common response to a particular event or phrase or saying. I don't know. Um, back to the original one though, the only thing I can think of, I think the videotaping works well, but you've got to have something that comes back as a cross check for validity where someone has no exposure to what you've been asking and are given the, the phrases, the terms, and so on and so forth, and then see if you come back with a similar kind of uh, interpretation of what they mean. But if you're getting that across different ethnic groups, that ends up to me being where your research probably ought to move. I, I don't know if this is, um, but uh, in situations where we felt like it was a, um, a pretty important interview, uh, or a, uh, if it was a KLE, we had three interpreters there. And so, um, one, if possible, was always a female. And, um, and she may be sitting in the, in the very back, and, and often it was somebody with a high level clearance because uh, some of these women, um, we could get them away. They, they, their experience was much, much broader than maybe a, a, a 25 year old woman. So, um, and then if we had some ethnicity issues, we might have a project and a costume interpreter in the room. They would often fight about what was actually said. And you're right, because they would say, no, that's not what they meant. They meant this. And you're right. Makes the, the analysis incredibly challenging because how can you, like, genuinely and authentically unpack text? If the text is a level of interpretation, it makes it very hard. So I don't so know. It's, that's great. How do you guys deal with um, nuance and metaphor when you're using an interpreter? Because I know when I when I used to uh, interpret Indonesian, the person who was asking me to do that was an American, and instead of using an Indonesian who had really good English, he used an English speaker who had decent Indonesian, me. Because he knew I would translate meaning more than I would translate words. Okay, does that make sense? Is if I if I would listen to an Indonesian translator who was a native Indonesian translating into English from an English speaker, you know, it's like, well, that made sense linguistically, but it totally missed the mark of what semantics. the meaning was. So, yeah, the semantics. And so um, one, I, think, again, I have no idea if this is even accessible or available or not, but sometimes it helps not just to have native speakers fighting amongst each other as to what the nuance or meaning was, but also, if it's available, a good English speaker who also speaks Pashtun or Dari or something else 
that can tell you, hmm, I think they're missing the, the, uh, the meaning. Or, I don't know, it goes both ways. I have no idea what your capabilities are in that regard, what the resources are. But I think anytime you deal with textual analysis and you're dealing with another language group, you're always going to be pushing the edge of the envelope as to what's credible. Text analysis, nerd analysis, you always have the filter and bias. Yeah. And you just, when you present your data, you really cannot defend it on the but to defend it. I think you can redefine the issue. It's kind of what we were starting with yesterday. In some respects, that's okay, because that's what human beings are. We're interpretive, we are interpretive beings. Anything and everything that comes through us, we filter. If we try to filter that out, sorry for the bad pun, if we try to filter that out and get rid of it, then we're not really being true to what we are in some respects. I think the ambiguity is not necessarily a bad thing if we recognize that the ambiguity can actually take us to some conclusions. So, 1986, my wife and I went to the Vancouver's World's Fair. Okay, um, <clears throat> Two-hour lines, three-hour lines, they were ridiculously long. We had no kids at the time, which was nice. You know, that would have been horrible. <laughs> oh, get me out of this. So we went to one of these pavilions. I can't even remember which one it was. We walked out of that pavilion afterward. We got in this knockdown, drag out argument as to what the, the message was. It was ridiculous. We were just like at each other. Going, oh, it was not right. And to this day, I mean, what is that? 20 some odd years later, we go, I was right in Vancouver. She goes, I was right. Neither of us even remember what it was. But we were completely convinced when we walked out that I had the right message and she had the wrong one and she was convinced the other way around. I think that happens all the time. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you're taking as an argument that human beings are interpretive. If human beings are interpretive, that's, that's the primary independent variable. So what do we do with that? If we have multiple interpretations across the word, it could indicate a variety of things. It could ind indicate the level of fluency that the person has in English, that could be one indicator, and there's ways that we could probably control for that. Or it could indicate that words, certain words or phrases can have multiple meanings given a different context, and then we have to explore what that might mean. The fact that you're telling me that multiple ethnic groups have different interpretations, wow, my alarm bells just go off and go, wow, that's really interesting. And then maybe, again, I don't know what the project is, but that might, that might influence me to take a different tack and say, maybe this is the most important thing that I ought to be looking at. That if there's commonality across these different ethnic groups, and how they're interpreting it differently from each other, that might be the most important piece of data I get out of this. I don't know, again, just working with limited variables. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, this guy that kind of dovetails with a couple of questions online is that you don't always get the interpreters that you wish you had, but the key part is understanding what their strength, weaknesses, biases, and good point. Do you guys do you talk with the interpreters beforehand? Do you try to get oh, a yeah. sense of who they are and and what their ex and what their experiences and background are? Sometimes yeah. it's the ideal, but we don't always. Just sometimes you just get you're going out in the field and go, "Oh, here's your interpreter." Okay. That's tough. We actually had two interpreters that we got to know, but we didn't really get to assess their skills before they came to our FOB. Mm -hmm. um, but we were able to have them for the time. We so got over, to know them. Yeah, over time you knew where they were them. going to go. Yeah, so. How often is that the case versus not the case? Um, actually, I know me and Chris were just saying we had a similar experience. I had interpreters assigned to me. I um, was so always working with the same people the entire time. Um, and I had very different levels. And I, I had three different interpreters. One of them was a young kid about 19 years old. Mm -hmm. He was an older guy. And he so he learned how to say dude and posh dude? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was in Iraq. Okay. <laughs> but I, in Arabic. And I had a third who was a cat too who spoke English as well as I did. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was racing Kuwait. Okay. And, and so what you were after, what is it dictated to? Good, good point. Yeah. So so some scenarios. So what would you use for which type of situation? So for instance, if I was going to like a bazaar where I knew older men were hanging out, I never brought the young kid because he got frustrated with the older guys. Um, mm -hmm. He did, and he would 
I, I, I had a similar situation. I had several interpreters assigned to me. So what I did, I did I, after making errors in front, I I realized they had the biases and I wasn't sure. So I did a bio on each each one of them, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it's amazing the differences in interpreters. The Assyrians, the Chalde Chaldeans, they were excellent, but they had a sense of resentment towards the uh, Sunni-dominated government of uh, Iraq, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> the Shiites had a different perception, all the similar. So I settled on out of about half a dozen, it was a Coptic Christian Egyptian who had been living in the U.S. for 30 years, so he's very Americanized, but spoke Arabic as a first language, and he was able to give me he would even argue with the other interpreters that that's not what they're saying. So you, you know, you're adding some flavor to it. There, there's kind of an axiom in, in uh, ethnographic research is that outsider status is not a bad deal. In some respects, um, especially if there's a lot of other common um, social economic similarities, same ethnic group, not necessarily the same religion or whatever. So I know. I'll, again, I'll just use some examples from the Mississippi Delta. I got answers to questions when I was working in the Mississippi Delta that nobody with a southern accent would have ever got. And I got them because no one anticipated that I had an agenda that I wasn't speaking. So I'm wondering about the Coptic Christian element is if that doesn't give somebody a leg up that A, there's another element about this. If I'm going to do some interviewing, I always want to find the marginal person in a group. The marginal person always knows all the secrets, and because they're already marginalized, they're not afraid of divulging. So I'm looking structurally, generally when I go into a context, I'm looking structurally for the person who I think is going to be on the fringe. That's who I'm looking for every time. That's got to be my never first contact. I would not use a soldier interpreter, and because you would never get him to say something to a high-ranking officer right. that he so, saw was offensive. That's he right. Would never say it. So there's... Yeah, there's, there's all these different kinds of places where a person might line up in a structure or a hierarchy that are going to or, or influence, not determine, but certainly influence what kind of information you're going to get from. I think there's a really good example of this it's in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books about, I think it was um, Tippy. Anyway, he talks about um, Korean Airlines. The Korean Airlines had this absolutely devastating crash where is plowed into the side of a mountain because in the Korean language there's this word Han, and Han means um, respect to higher authority, and it's built within the language itself. You and, and a lot of Asian languages have this. You talk a higher language to a superior, they talk a lower language back. And so all communication in the cockpit was in Korean, and the, and the co-pilot could see that they were going to smash into the mountain because they were listening to us on the black, you know, on the voice recorder afterward, and he said nothing because the captain was saying, it's okay. So from that, then they switched over to everything in international flights is in English. And then you got rid of that built-in bias into a culture and the language that it uses that wouldn't allow the, the co-pilot to challenge the pilot, even though he knew they were going to crash into a mountain. I think some of those things, the outsider status is a double-edged sword. You're going to miss some data, but you're going to get other data you would never get because people are going to be willing to divulge certain things to somebody who they don't think is really part of the group. So maybe use both. I don't know. Does Blake, does that work in terms of using both in a multiple perspective? Yeah, and I, well, and I had enough language skills in Arabic to where, let's say I was doing a survey, mm -hmm. I would sit down with the interpreter and try to run through it with them. That works great. So, so when you do that, what what would you do if you got the uh, a contradiction across it? From Arabic to English. Yeah. Uh, then you got to go back and reformat your question. You okay. Gotta... So you took it as the question itself had the ambiguity. Yes. Okay. As we were talking about it, um, <clears throat> I actually encountered some of the problems that he did. 
So after my third week, I, I went to the uh, interpreter pool and I said, uh, give me your worst interpreters. <laughs> and I said, because the worst interpreters I could train, nobody else wanted them. I could go over the research with them, what I was actually looking for, work with them, and, and nobody else had wanted to work with them, so I could always get those same interpreters. So how does the system work for interpreters? Do they get paid by event, or are they paid? No, they're salary. Like okay, all right. But, but I mean, um, <laughs> and you were talking about what does it mean? I, I always told them, give me a direct translation, uh -huh. and we'll hash through it later. Okay. And so if there's some other meaning, and then we always. So again, I, I did that, but I had to ask for the worst interpreters to be able to do it. Why? Well, 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 because the other ones. Well, because people had to you know, about They had or? reputations as good interpreters and bad interpreters, and the bad interpreters were never used. Uh, and they were grateful, kind of, for work because they got to sit. Generally, who makes the reputation? Is it is it a fellow social scientists that pass word along? No, it's the youth. It's the unit. Okay. Any other interpreters? Yeah, that'd be like an absolute soap opera. So you went with the marginalized ones. Yeah, well, it was the marginalized ones. <laughs> and actually, I found they were great. Believe it or not, sometimes they just had to have somebody have a little faith in them and wanted to work with them and know that somebody would support them. Again, sometimes, ironically, I think in terms of doing interviews and such, outsider status, regardless of marginality, is almost an accident to me. Is the more marginal you are, generally, the more data you're going to get. Because if they look at you and they think, well, here's the moron, I can tell you whatever you want. They generally do. Um, at times, I'm amazed at what kind of information comes. And there have been occasions where I've said, I don't want to know that because I don't want my nose to be subpoenaed. <laughs> You know, I know where every crack house in the Mississippi Delta is. And I was studying fish. Like, stop it. I don't want to know where the crack house is going. Yeah, so they just kind of, the information flows. But I think, again, part of that is outsider status. And if you can find who who knows all the secrets but aren't worried about the old them, that's a whole different kind of entry point than automatically starting with the most powerful person or perceived most influential person in a place. I usually want to start the exact opposite. The marginal person is usually very non-influential. Uh, yeah. Uh, slightly different. So uh, the actual asking of the, in the survey, the, the reality downrange is that a lot of the sample sizes are going to be small. Right. Uh, what, are, what are some of the ways that you know, effectively dealt with that so we don't get So when you're talking about a sample size, you're talking about a sample size for interviewing or a sample size for inferential statistics kind of sample size? A any kind of survey because you don't have access survey. to So it. inferential statistics. Oh, so randomized if at all possible. Um, I don't know if you're going to have to help me with this because I mean, usually uh, around 900 is um, the ideal optimal because beyond that, I mean, um, and I mean, you can, between 800 and 900, uh, it's a good number. If it's so you random, run a power statistic and decide what should be the optimal number given the... Because uh, the reduction of uh, uh, errors uh, right. beyond that, uh, you, no matter how far you go, I mean, you could go up to 2,000, it doesn't really it's change much. Change, right. Exactly. So, so you're so, looking at the power statistic saying, this is what I need, I'm going to if it is diminishing returns, if like it is a good it. random sample, if it's a good random, if sample. you have a good so, sampling frame and you start mm -hmm. with it, and you. So let me ask you guys, how how do you randomize? Okay, can, can yeah. you just uh, please uh, rephrase that? How would you instead of number size, you will never get past 100 respondents for an interview, especially if you're in an academic area? Mm -hmm. But I mean, let's put it in a percentage wise, right? Yeah. You go into a village or a district or an area that got probably 500 people. Right. How do you feel, what percentage that you put, given that it's random? Yeah, well the irony of the smaller, the smaller the sample frame, the larger the percentage of people that actually have to be interviewed in order to approximate mm -hmm. the arguments of a normal curve, which we all know are normal and not normal. But um, we, we have to do that, the larger the, the smaller the group, the larger the size. And there's a whole bunch of different things you can get online now in terms of power statistics, it's basically running it to see what your sample should be. I have no doubts that you guys have to violate those at every moment of every day. That's, I, I, I'm not even trying to second guess that. It doesn't mean that what you gather isn't valuable, however. Okay? It, does mean, however, that you can't make certain claims in terms of statistical prowess or power, excuse me, um, 
that really are dependent upon you having a randomized sample across a particular population and then being able to infer results from that to a larger population. It doesn't mean it doesn't give you good useful data though. Okay, so one of the things I would argue is, and I've been in similar situations where sometimes I take a census instead of a sample. If I've got a group of, of uh, 50 people, why would I take a sample? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the whole thing, and then I don't even need inferential statistics. By definition, inferential statistics is to infer to a larger population because I've sampled across a smaller one. So just do the census. Go in there and ask them all, and if you miss one or two, so what? You, I mean, you missed one or two. If you miss even 10, you've got 40 out of 50. That's going to give you an awful lot of, of practical, useful information that you need. Okay? So maybe the 10 you missed, you know, you always run the risk of the 10 you missed or the 10 who are causing all the problems, if you want to put it that way. And there's a reason they didn't show up to the interview. But then you can check that. You can, you can ask around. You, you follow up and you say, well, I noticed that uh, certain people didn't show up. Um, can you think of any reason why they, uh, yeah, they were just busy or something? You know, I don't know. There's um, a really good book, by the way, that I recommend to you. It's uh, David Quinn Patton. Anybody know this? It's uh, um, Qualitative Evaluation Research Methods. I think it's the title. And it's good for qualitative, in my opinion, and quantitative. Because one of the things he talks about is when you're doing these kinds of things direct one on one with, with people, you never ask the question directly. That's the problem with surveys when you're going outside of the United States. You know, even in the United States, Criminal self-report, how many old ladies did you kill this week? Five, you know? It's just dumb. So, so he gave an example in this book about a researcher who was trying to understand the coca industry in, in Colombia. And so he starts out asking people, well, I'd like to study about cocaine. And got, oh, there's no cocaine use here. Whenever I'm in the Golden Triangle and I'm on one of those little speedboats on the Mekong River, I always say, so, uh, <laughs> You guys still running drugs here? Just for fun. <laughs> oh, no, no, we haven't done that for years. But make sure that seat there doesn't get wet. <laughs> you know? It's like, OK. Um, and so he says, the best approach to this is to find out something that's indirectly linked and then ask about it. So he found out that people whose donkeys get sick, they give them cocaine. So he starts interviewing people. Saying, what should I do? Ah, I'm not give me cocaine. Goes, really? Well, I've never heard of that method before. What do I do about doing something about it? Oh, go talk to so and so. And immediately he had a whole chain. Uh, all the way, what he was originally looking for was being stonewalled on each point because he was trying to use this really direct approach, and people saw right through it. But when he was asking these indirect questions, then he got this whole link of chain. I also sometimes refer to this as the barium trace dye method. It's my own, it's my own particular terminology. Is I want to follow something all the way through a system, all the way through a social structure or system, and see where it hits every point. So I'm looking for an access point. Again, I want to start with a marginal gatekeeper, because they're going to be the ones that are going to open the gate wider than anybody else. I'm going to inject the dye in. And I'm going to, from a distance as well as directly, watch where that thing goes all the way through the system. I can do that through an interview. I can do that through surveys, even if they're not randomized surveys. OK, so I realize, I totally realize, because I've been in not, I can, I'm not going to argue I've been in a similar context where I'm downrange. I have been in context where I know um, I have to have a result, and I don't have all the tools available to me for, as the scientific method claims. But I also walk out of there confident that what I've produced is valid, given the parameters it was produced in, and also applicable. And I can argue those things. But it's back to the crescent wrench argument. If I have a 14 millimeter wrench for a 14 millimeter nut, that's a better option. If I don't have a 14 millimeter wrench, I can adjust my crescent wrench to do the job. And that's what I'm arguing is, is you can make survey research work, even violating some of the basic parameters, but you're not going to be able to make some of the claims for that research when you're done. But it should still be useful, valid, 
for what you need to use it for. You're not going to be, you're not necessarily, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, inferring your results from a local context to a larger, broader context, are you, if you're using the survey? So in other words, if I'm looking at one village, one group, and and I know I violated survey research protocols, but I still have useful information that tells me an awful lot about this particular village or group, I'm not using that to assume that all villages or groups have that same kind of outcome, right? It should be fine. Let me ask you guys another question, if you don't mind. How often do you coordinate use of variables or questions and such so that you have um, comparative basis across each other's research? Uh, it's, it's problematic. Okay. project over four different, uh, actually more, but four different teams in each tab and three each teams. Yeah, I can think of at least a couple of reasons but why it would be a good thing if they would do it. Yeah, no, it's great, but uh, honestly, there are only a handful of times I've ever heard of that happening in HTS. Well, then you get the comparative element, but the other thing I would think you would get over time is some kind of external validation as to which variables or questions or, or approaches have the most efficacy um, across a spectrum versus constantly having to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. I mean, I don't, again, you guys are gonna have to educate me. That, that, that's the thing we always push it, is you know, keeping tra track of the raw data. If you're doing a study and you're like, I, I've heard this before, um, can trees think? Well, no, they can't. Okay, good, we, we knocked that out. And somebody else is going to well, come Well, the last later. tree I interviewed. But, yeah. But, yeah, but do you report, hey, there's no relationship? Do you make a big report? You know, do it. So if you're investigating something and, it, and it's basically the null and it doesn't right. seem significant, well, it's actually still significant. It's just that often doesn't get reported and nobody hears about it. So if there's no relationship you know, between uh, just hypothetically ethnic oh, tensions and, and, and security and you find that, well, do you make a big report that there's no 
and this, then somebody else does the same thing. And this is lecture five ninety eight in a series with with students we work with is no finding is probably one of the biggest findings you can have is because if you are anticipating the result that doesn't happen and you're confident in the data that you gathered and the method by which you gathered it and the theory that you used, that's interesting. It's really interesting. And I can't think of a better way of 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 looking at an applied context where you're confident going in if you're doing any kind of supposition or null hypothesis testing, if it doesn't work out, boy, that's that ought to be sending off gigantic alarm bells and typo drums. Yeah, so the, there were a couple issues we investigated that went down a rabbit hole and it was nothing. It, we were completely wrong. And it's like if we somebody else might have done the same thing, it's just wasted time and resources. So we always tried to the biggest issue that people, I think the reason that a lot of times HTAP and HTTP don't um, work together is because in some instances, instances, the information that is provided to the HTAP gets generalized. Okay. And, and that makes sense, actually. So, make sense. You yeah, don't, that would make sense. so if you're in a specific district like Capiza, and this is a study done in this district, I mean, certain province like Capiza, and this is an issue that we found in this research design conducted with That information that is brought up to the HTAP might have been generalized that in RC East, this is what's happening, and it's not. So I think that's where the hesitation lies, okay. which can be easily um, subsided. If Yeah. We've, we've kind of touched on it that and this is a bit of a as far as collaboration and you know doing research but the question that came in was the, the reality for these students though is that they're trying to answer the commander's critical information requests on a mission that's not necessarily devoted to their research with limited amount of time limited access to population right and that at the end of it it could get generalized into something that's a that's a shoot no shoot type decision so what, what are some of the ways to to balance that or that you have been able to work through some of these things you can already generalize out of a small sample size and a small area but you can compare it we have an entity that uh, which is called uh, social science research and analysis mm -hmm. which is an actual contractor that if you want to study a larger area which is like district province or even part of half of the country if you want to do it as nationwide or countrywide let's say in Afghanistan you can do it then you compare between let's say RC East regional command East regional command West and you can compare and they have standardized most of it is quantitative uh, study but that's when you can compare the same thing in different areas okay. is that what you're referring to it is and and let's go back to do some qualitative data. Can I ask you guys how you uh, reduce your data? How do you codify your data? Do you use any particular software programs or just use Word or what? Or I'm assuming that you're taking chunks of text and data and you're coding it into themes. And so, what do you use to do that? Like the you uh, use. Yeah. Um, thank you. Put him on the spot. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a text analysis extraction tool that okay. you can use as software to do thematic coding. Unfortunately, it's not nearly as reliable as doing it by hand. Right, and that's actually what it yeah. misses in text. Okay. Um, yep. So I think they all do. By the way. They Even do. the ones who claim they do. So if you if you have the time, obviously going through and doing your thematic, best option. Um, and then I I've been working with an ANAT. Very much a quantitative uh, mathematical software suite as well. Okay. And that can calculate uh, like centrality of a node or degrees of separation and closeness. Okay. Based off of GIS kind it's of? Based off so you of have to it's large geo code. Based off of, uh, algebra, what makes you see algebra? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, so it's you're, a longer you're worried more about spatial 
location and distance on a social level or spatial uh, <coughs> in terms of distance, actual it's, physical, it or is both? Both, but um, it is both geographic. It can be either geographic or it can be um, social. Like, it, it depends on what entity you're looking at. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at something like supply, like how supplies are distributed, right. then you're probably going to go more geographic. If right. you're looking at how information travels across the network, then you're probably going to do both. Yeah, you can do both. Right. It's it's if you track just about everything through the coordinate to respect coordinates. Tiger and Sydney. Tiger and Sydney, yeah. Okay. So you can you can do yeah, you can do both and you can you can pump out results and see if there's any any significant correlations between them. So one more question and we'll take a break. Um, and again, forgive me for my lack of uh, literacy and fluency in, in uh, military lingo. But is it the R R C uh, R C regional command? Oh, okay. The ones I met with yesterday. Right? Oh, yes. the R R C, the reach back. Uh, yeah, it's, so reach back. Back. it's anyone doing any kind of of meta analyses across? What kind of meta analysis? Meta analysis. Where you're looking at a variety of things. So if I've got geocoding on different kinds of networks and and other kinds of things, I should have data sitting there about certain geo spots that I could then incorporate other kind of social economic and other kinds of data with. Uh, I'm just curious. Yeah, we do. You know, as we were kind of talking about the HTAC is constantly reviewing the stuff below, and they're actually doing a lot of their own work mm -hmm. as you go up to the next step up. Uh, the TCE, at, at least in Iraq, the last social scientist I talked to about this said, basically our job is to make sure the information gets out to everyone, and they didn't do as much individual projects so much as comparing. They did a lot of that, so they were kind of looking at comparative analysis of different areas of operation. So, I guess, again, the outsider looking in, I find it kind of ironic that if you my understanding of like military school is you're going there and you're learning the art of war, you know, and these grand narratives of different things, and yet you've got an opportunity here to actually create some really interesting data that can speak to larger issues across the events potentially. And well, that's if you're at operational strategic or tactical. And I just heard the term grand narrative like two weeks ago. So. How grand? It's <laughs> called something else. <laughs> yeah. The RRC can do meta analysis and they can add a uh, geospatial dimension to it. Right. If you provide them with enough raw data and you give them some time and space, uh, they will give you that kind of. How well do they deal with qualitative or textual data? I try them in the quantitative, I don't try them in qualitative, but they say they can do it. Uh, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, I would imagine. I think uh, the RRC actually has a lot of regional. Uh, experts, as opposed to a lot of us that go into the field, we're kind of generalist or right. discipline specific. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot of products that they've done that is, um, you know, like a, like a, it wasn't directly tasked to them, um, but they have looked through stuff and said, hey, this is some stuff you, you might be looking at. This is actually some literature on the topic, what other people are doing in another area. So mm -hmm. uh, they, they do it. I mean, okay. I, in my experience, they, they didn't do a lot of. Self-directed research. Uh, I mean, it seemed they were more providing. They had so much to do with just the stuff that we were requesting, as mm -hmm. far as doing any meta analysis. Okay. At least it wasn't apparent. There just wasn't enough uh, degrees of freedom to actually pursue it. Then. Well, should we take a break? Cool. Yeah.